Shi Duchim Podcast. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Nobody Talks Shaduchim Podcast. I'm Yona. And I'm Khani. And it has been a while since we've hosted an episode, but it's good to be back. For today's episode, we're going to be discussing the Shidduch process from the perspective of a Shadchan. The good, the bad, and the ugly. A tell-all episode with a guest who's from somewhere close to home. Khani, will you do the honor of introducing our guest? Always an honor, Yona. So... Today we're going to introduce a very highly, highly recommended shadchan. Unfortunately, not one of the shadchanim involved in us meeting, but we recommend her 1,000% nonetheless. Mommy Laster, welcome. It's an honor. Well, let me just pause there for a second for any who might be confused. This is, in fact, my mother and Khani's mother-in-law, just in case that was not clear. Yes, she's our Mommy Laster. Not the rest of the world. What would you like the rest of the world to know you as? Thank you so much, Khani, for that amazing introduction. To the rest of the world, I'm known as Hindi Laster. And to some, I'm Queen Shatrin, together with my partner in crime and Shaduchim, Chaya Kaplowitz, who unfortunately is sick tonight and couldn't be here. It seems like it should be easy, but it's not. Shaduchim are tough. Just dealing with those shadchans, the awkward first date, chat, and trying to look your best on those dates. It's a whole to-do list. Now that to-do list gets a lot easier when you're getting guidance, funny dating stories, and experiences that you can relate to. So you can be prepared, lift your mood, and get connected with everything Shaduchim. With, with us, us, the Nobody Talks Shaduchim podcast crew, IJ, Avery, Rosie, and the Lasters. Listen to us on over a dozen platforms on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, so I guess that's a great way to start now that we've mentioned your partner in crime. If you can take us back to the beginning of your career as a Shadchan, how did it start? What inspired you to take on this role for other people? And how did you and Chaya Kaplowitz team up? So actually, it was never in my plan to be a Shadchan. That was um, the furthest thing from my mind. I actually did make a couple of Shadduchim. I set up a cousin 20-something years ago and um, another friend's child. But I never thought to do anything like this with my spare time until we um, were invited out one Shabbos to friends for lunch. And I was trying to um, to talk their two single sons into finding a shidduch for our daughter's friends. They told me that I was so good at this that I should become a shatchan. And I laughed. I said, I am definitely not that, you know, that stereotypical yenta shatchan. And I also just didn't have the personality, I thought, and the self-confidence, you know, to do this. And they kept telling me that it was my achrayas to do it because every neighborhood had representatives coming to their yeshivas to represent the girls in their areas. And Queens was the only neighborhood that didn't have a shatchan, and it was a disservice to the girls from Queens. And I, you know, smiled, and I was polite, and I went home, and I completely forgot about it. One night, my friend Chaya Kaplowitz and I decided to go out together for Chinese, and we're sitting there having a nice dinner, and lo and behold, those two brothers walk into the restaurant, and they said, oh, so glad we met you here. When can you come to our yeshiva to meet with the guys? And at that point, I was sitting with Chaya, and I said, listen, Chaya, I can't do this myself. These guys aren't going to stop until I become a shatchan. Would you like to become a shatchan with me? And she said, well, what qualifications do you need to be a shatchan? I said, I have no idea. Let's figure it out together. And the two of us that night went home and we posted on our Q Gardens Hills Chesed chat that if anybody is in need of a shatchan, we would love to help them. And within 24 hours, we had over 100 people contact us. We had people from not only the New York area, we had from Florida and California and Pennsylvania, and um, our heads were spinning. We we didn't know the first thing about being a shatchan. We actually then um, went to um, one of the boys' yeshivas in Muncie and asked a couple of inappropriate questions. We learned the hard way um, what to ask and what not to ask, but... Um, we actually had a lot of fun. Um, we, you know, there was a very large learning curve there, and we actually had some success quickly. The best success stories are the people who don't aspire for the power and are sort of thrust into it, and they end up doing the best at their position because they're not in it for self glorification. They have uh, sort of a higher purpose in mind. I also feel like you just made yourself and Shachar in general sound so much less scary because it's re- it's really a grassroots project. 
you just start with a vision and it takes you to a whole nother place and good things come of it nonetheless. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Uh, before I got involved with Shaduchim, I had basically sworn that I would never go to a Shadchan because you get this this picture in mind of, you know, some Yenta lady from a very specific neighborhood um, with, you know, certain mannerisms who's sort of in it for the prestige and the money involved in making a shidduch and is just going to set you up with whoever, you know, the first person that pops into their head is, regardless of whether or not it's anything that you're looking for. Um, and you kind of learn through this process that it depends. Some people are like that. There are shadchanim like that. But then there are also shadchanim who are, you know, very many, probably most, are just regular people who, for whatever reason, ended up uh, thinking that they'd be good at it or being told that they'd be good on it, at it and get thrust into the position. Um, with that being said, you know, having the experience that you do, you've already been doing it for a bunch of years at this point. Eight years. Okay, so what are some of the problems that you've seen within the shidduch system? And I want to break this question up into three parts. Some of the problems you've seen with singles, with parents, and with shadchanim. And you can give a, you know, a story for, for each category um, if something comes to mind, just to, you know, to, to highlight some of the, the issues that you've seen. Okay, so um, when it comes to singles, I find that often singles are just not flexible. They have their um, preconceived notions of exactly the kind of person they're going to marry um, down to the height. So just last week, I had a girl come. She's five foot two. She won't date anybody who's under five ten because she likes tall men. So if I had Mr. Perfect at five eight, she would say no to five eight at this point. She's only twenty one years old. She said when she's twenty four, twenty five, maybe she'll reconsider. So in my opinion, that's just. It's silly. I personally have a son who's 6'1". His wife is 4'11". Was he looking for a short girl? No. But he was open-minded, flexible. Miss Wright was 4'11". And he took the opportunity and Baruch Hashem flew with it. So when you have like these ideas in your head and you're not willing to budge and open your mind and be a little bit flexible, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for heartache. And there are a lot of singles that are going through so much pain um, because they're not finding the right ones. And and I try to gently hint to them that they're just not being flexible. And if they would just open their minds and broaden their horizons a little bit, they might find the right person. Unfortunately for me, I'm not pushy enough. I don't have the chutzpah that many shadchanim have to be blunt. This is something that we have butted heads on many a time when I've said, why do you deal with these people? Right. So, you know, having chutzpah, I guess, is a good thing. And a lot of the shadchanim I know have a lot of chutzpah and they say it as it is. And it doesn't matter if they're going to hurt the person's feelings or insult them. I can't do that. And I don't want to be that nasty person, that mean person. I just don't want to be that person. So I'm not blunt. I hint. And um, very often they don't get it. Um, What I started to do is, you know, I used to keep my personal life out of it. But I started telling my personal stories. My daughter was open-minded to date almost any type of guy except for guys that went to two specific yeshivas. Our son-in-law went to those two yeshivas that she refused to date guys from. She's tall. He's short. Like I said, our son is 6'1", our daughter-in-law is 4'11". If my own kids would not have opened their minds, then where would they be now? But even though, you know, they said they were not open-minded, they did open their minds. And, um, you know, Baruch Hashem, they found. Um, Yona insists that he never said that he wouldn't date girls from out of town. I always envision myself marrying a girl from out of town, so I will fight you on this one. Well, it, it, was, it, it wasn't as simple as that. I'm not going to fight you on it, but... Um, the traveling part was um, challenging. Yes, the traveling part was a challenge, but that was always stated from up front, and uh, it worked out nicely. It yeah. worked out. I mean, I sweetened the deal pretty well. You only had to come in once before I decided that New York is my home for a Ex- little bit. Exactly, and and it everything went according to my, just to defend myself here, I always said I would not travel in the beginning until I feel comfortable enough with the girl that there's real potential. And I mean, Khani came in for the first bunch of dates and then I felt quite comfortable 
So I went in for the next couple of dates, and then she moved to New York, so it was perfect. Good thing you came in before I moved, because when else would you have tasted that ice cream? Amen. Amen. But I will quote you. You used to say when you know we had all those resumes piled up, there are so many girls right here in New York. Why do I have to look at the ones out of town? Yes. When, the, when I felt like all things were equal, then I would tend to go out first with the ones who were already in the area, but that wasn't a hard and fast rule. Okay, so c- continuing on with the, with uh, the singles, the problems. So you mentioned that people are they're too they're not flexible, they're too rigid in their in their criteria, and uh, you feel like that messes them up. Is there anything else that you think, whether it's uh, applies to all singles equally or guys and girls specifically? The pictures. Um, I I feel that the the pictures that singles give usually are not a good representation. And I find that, you know, it, it used to be just the guys. Now it's the girls and the guys equally. They will look at a picture and just toss it and not go further with it. And I am that one shotgun, that one female shotgun that gets it, that gets it, especially with the guys when they say, you know, it's not my look. I get it. But when I do have the chutzpah and push and say, trust me on this one, it's just a horrible picture. I wish that they would just trust me a little bit and ask, you know, make the phone calls. In the olden days, before we had all this internet and WhatsApp, we used to have to make phone calls and ask, what does the person look like? Are they attractive? Are they blonde? Are they thin? Are they, you know, are they average uh, weight? You know, whatever questions, whatever it is that's important, you know, ask the questions. Don't just look at a picture that's clearly horrible and nix it if everything else seems right based on a picture. Yeah, I actually think that uh, we're, we're going to bring IJ on a little bit later, and uh, I actually think that that will sort of tie into one of the questions that he wanted to ask. So still with problems that are related to the system, we'd love to hear if there's if there are any trends that you've noticed amongst parents or Shadchanim that you know might mess things up unnecessarily. So as far as the parents go, I find very often, you know, parents have different expectations from their kids. Um, One example is I actually had a girl come to meet me several months ago. Her mother came along with her. And when I asked the girl what type of, you know, guy she's looking for, she said she wants a guy who is working. If he's not working, he should at least be in college or, you know, on his way to some type of career. And the mother stopped her and said, no, my daughter would like a guy that's going to learn for at least a year or two before marriage. And the mother and daughter had a little bit of an argument in front of me. I find very often the pa- when the parents get involved and speak to me, they are not telling me exactly what it is their their child is looking for. They're telling me what it is they would like for their child. Yeah, that's uh, that's a very fair point. It's something that... Uh, I think I, I've I've definitely witnessed happening while uh, living under your roof. Um, I've definitely seen heard heard the stories. So now let's talk about um, people within your profession, the shadchanim out there. What are some issues that you feel your fellow shadchanim are getting wrong? And give us an example of a, a story in which a shadchan was totally out of bounds. So I think a lot of people today especially parents are afraid of the shotgun. I just had a conversation with a friend tonight. I had a suggestion for her daughter. And she told me that her daughter was going to go out on a second date with a guy that she was dreading. But she felt she had to because if she didn't go out on the second date, the shotgun would never set her up again. And I've heard that many, many times before. It's like the shotgun has a certain power over the singles. Um, about two years ago, I suggested um, a guy to a girl, and the mother was very, very happy with the suggestion. She jumped at it. But for some reason, finding an appropriate time for a date was impossible. The girl was always busy. She either um, had a bridal shower she was making or a job interview. She went to Florida for two days. It was the most bizarre situation. But at the end of the day, they got four or five dates in. A few weeks later, I ran into the guy in the supermarket 
And he came over to me and he said, remember, you know, when you set me up with so-and-so, we were never able to, um, to find a time to go out on a date. And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, I found out exactly why. And I said, why was that? And he said, because she was dating my best friend at the same time. Oh my gosh. So I, I was shocked because, um, you know, this mother, I was in touch with this mother a lot and she was, you know, always begging me to find, she was looking for a very specific type of guy and always begging me, please, you know, try to find someone for my daughter. And she was just so on top of things. And she was the type of person that I would think would do things the right way. So the next time she contacted me, I said to her, listen, I don't think I could set your daughter up on, unless we had a conversation first. So she called me and, um, I told her that I found out that she was dating these two good friends at the exact same time. The mother practically burst into tears. She told me that she paid a certain shachin, a retainer, to represent her daughter. And the shachin called her up and said he had a great guy for this girl. And, um, you know, she should just give the yes without even looking into him. So the mother told the shachin, my daughter's busy right now. We just gave somebody a yes. And the shachin told her straight out, you know, this is a very desirable guy. And if your daughter's not going to go out with him, I won't set her up ever again. And she said to me, I felt bullied. I felt so bullied. And I felt that if I said no, my daughter's whole reputation would be ruined. And she said that this whole dating process was so hard on her daughter that she cried before every date because she really liked both guys and enjoyed the dates and it was so confusing to her and she also felt that she was doing something so wrong and she was being deceptive um and uh, I was I was shocked you know I've I've heard stories like this but I didn't think they really existed wow and just out of curiosity as as a shadchan, you know, kind of like one of the gang, one person in a field of many, do you feel like an individual shadchan would ever have the kind of influence or does it need to be to, the kind of influence to stop that kind of behavior or does it have to be more of a collective stance where everyone will agree that this is unacceptable? It would definitely have to be a collective stance, but there are different levels of shadchanim and I don't think that this type of shadchan could ever get stopped this this particular shadchan and the shadchanim in the same category as this shadchan will continue doing these things always aye, aye, aye. well now that we've heard all of the the rotten things that are happening in the shidduch system. Let's uh, let's move on to something a little bit more uh, a little bit more positive, on pretty much the exact flip side. Um, what are some things that you think work about the system, the shidduch system, um, and give us some ex- inspiring examples? And again, let's split it into categories: the singles, the parents, and the shadchanim who did it right. Well, as far as the singles, I work with many wonderful singles open-minded singles that really are motivated to get married. And, um, you know, they listen to ideas, they listen to suggestions. And even if it's, you know, not something that is a hundred percent what they want to go with, um, they will listen to why it might make sense to go out on a date. And, you know, when they do that, it's, um, it's actually, it's very refreshing. And even if it doesn't work out, they come back and they'll say, you know, I'm really glad I went out with this person. Um, even though it didn't work out, it, it was a quality person and it was a nice experience. So, you know, there are so many unpleasant dating stories and dating experiences that when somebody comes back saying that at least it was a, it was a nice experience, it was positive, it was a good person who treated me well, it's all worth it. And very often, you know, two people go out and they think that, you know, it's really not for me, but I'll give it a shot and hey, it works. Okay, awesome. And do you have any, uh, an example of, uh, you know, an inspiring sort of story about a specific single? So um, I was involved in a shidduch that, you know, Baruch Hashem, it's a beautiful marriage and um, they're very, very happy. Um the girl liked the guy right away. Um, 
but there was something about his look that bothered her. But she said he was so nice and she really didn't think that she would ever get past whatever it was that was bothering her about his look, but she was going to go out on a second date with him, you know, just because he was such a mensch. They went out on a second date and she called me and said again, she had such a nice time and he's such a gentleman and he treated her so nicely that even though it still really, really bothers her, she's going to give it another chance because he deserves it. He's earned it. And he was smitten from from date number one. And after date number three, I never heard another thing about his looks again. It was smooth sailing from there on. So that was, to me, that was a very inspiring story. Awesome. Um, and now um, regarding parents. Who are the parents that you that you find are handling things the right way? And give us an example of a parent who really stepped up to the plate and, and did what they were supposed to without uh, sort of overstepping. So I, I deal with a lot of wonderful parents who, um, first of all, they show their appreciation. You know, I, this is not, I work full time. I have a family. My life is, Baruch Hashem, very, very busy. This is something that I do in the free time that doesn't really exist. So when a parent, you know, just is appreciative, says thank you, um, speaks to me like a mensch and, you know, doesn't call me up yelling and screaming at me, expecting, you know, that's very, very much appreciative. And I have many, many wonderful parents who just, you know, that they're, they're very menschlach and they, you know, they appreciate and, they're open-minded. To me, it's all about being open-minded. And I will sometimes explain to them why it's worth, you know, giving something that is not necessarily, you know, their idea of perfection a shot. And very often they'll think it through and, and they will give it a chance. For example, I have a parent whose daughter was dating a guy pretty seriously, um, in his mind, they were getting married. She was very, very into him for the first five dates. And then she had some concerns after that. And her mother would call me up and tell me what her daughter was thinking and ask me my opinion. And the mother, the daughter, and I all worked together. We spoke about it. We got her to open up and to express her feelings. And um, and in the end, ultimately, she did break up with the guy, but she did it in the right way. And it was because her mother was involved in the whole situation and her mother was listening to me and telling her daughter, let's trust her because she has experience and she's seen this before and I'm sure she's steering us in the right direction. So because they were open to listening to what I had to say and they took my advice, the whole breakup was less devastating to the guy the way it was handled than it than it could have been. And I always tell people this is my opinion and this is the advice I have for you. It doesn't mean that I'm 100% right. I'm not God. But from my past experiences, this is what I suggest. And usually it turns out right. Yeah, I think it's in the right situations, it's good when the parent is a reasonable, logical um, party who's involved and, you know, who can guide their child to do what's best for them and what's right um, without commandeering the situation and speaking completely on their behalf. And I also think that how, I'm sure you see this all the time, how a person chooses to end a relationship says almost as much as about them, if not more, than how they conduct themselves while they're in that relationship. A hundred percent. And in, in this particular case, the girl wanted to text the, the guy and end the relationship and I told the mother, listen, you know, it's just wrong. It's not the right way. And the mother agreed and, you know, we, we worked it out. So sometimes teamwork really is necessary. And when you have the parent on board, it really is helpful. Definitely. Um, okay, so I, I guess, the, you know, in this topic, the last category is shadchanim. What are some of the things that you think mark a good shadchan? What makes a shadchan a successful and 
and good shadchan to work with, and what are some stories that you have of shadchanim who've done it right? From uh, you know the question you asked me before about shadchanim, you know you would think I thought poorly of all shadchanim because I you know didn't have a very nice story to tell you, but all in all, the women that I work with are amazing. One is more amazing than the next. I, um, you know, many people, you know, talk about shadchanim that try to steal the shit off from people and they want all the recognition and the fame. Uh, in my in my experience, it's the opposite. You know, I'll have a girl and I'll, you know, I'll suggest her to somebody that I know works with a certain guy and she'll say to me, listen, you just handle the whole thing. Let's just get these kids married or I'll, you know, tell somebody you just handle it. Let's just get these kids married. And that's really, you know, that's what I find. I find most of the shadchanim that I work with are women who have large families. They work, they're so busy and they really do this because they, they want to help. It's all about Let's just get them married. And, you know, I, I find that they're just, they're selfless. They're getting phone calls at midnight. They're getting phone calls at 8 o'clock in the morning and at every hour in between. And I find that they just handle everybody with respect, with kindness and compassion. And that's the most important thing to me, that everybody leaves the shachin feeling like a mensch and not feeling bad about themselves. All right. And do you have a specific instance of a shachin that you've dealt with who, who you know, you think exemplified that? Yeah, actually, I'm a shachin that you know very well. Um, oh. I, one shachin in particular, she'll take any case of a person who has a sick parent or a sick child in the family or who who has money issues or like any any nebuch situation she will take upon herself to marry off that single and she will spend hours and hours texting calling please let's find somebody for her and you know when she sets somebody up and there's a little bump in the road she'll find a dating coach she'll she'll talk to them herself she'll do anything you know necessary to try to you know keep the shit off going or to fix any bumps there are in the road a- amazing person um also a mother of many young children, has a business, yet she gives of herself. I'll see her on the WhatsApp group at one o'clock in the morning posting things. And I'm like, I'm saying to myself, why don't you just go to sleep? But she just, you know, until she gets the job done, she won't rest. Are we giving a shout out here to Bluma? I guess we are. <laughs> For the hour shadchan. Yes, yes, indeed. And Bluma was fantastic. And she really did uh, go above and beyond. Hi, it's Khani from the Nobody Talks Shadokhin podcast. Dating sites are a bit technical and so tedious to operate. Now there's an all new way to get access to Shadokh resumes and meet that special somebody. The Shadokhin group on WhatsApp by Shadokhin Shifi has hundreds of guys and girls resumes posted to it. Resumes are posted and you can contact whoever posted that resume if you're interested in going out with that person. The group has dozens of matches made every week. To join the group, WhatsApp 443-333-7363. To join the Shidduchim WhatsApp group by Shadchan Shifi. So now for story time. Um, if you have any particularly inspirational stories of Shidduchim that you and Chaya have made, how they came about, or if there were any particularly funny or awkward Shidduch situations that you've dealt with that you think our audience would find entertaining. Give us a couple. So my favorite story took place, um, I would say, about six, seven years ago. I had met a guy... Um, I don't even remember where I met him, but nicest guy you'd ever want to know. Sweet, smart, had a good business going, beautiful Midos. And I tried to set him up with a girl I had met. Also smart girl, nice girl. Um, She had very fine Midos. And um, the guy said he was interested in going out with this girl. I send his resume to the girl, and I get a phone call from her mother. Her mother says to me that she's offended by the suggestion that I made to her daughter. So I was a little bit taken aback because he was really a wonderful guy. I I couldn't think of 
anything offensive. So the first thing she tells me is that um, the word she used was intact. They're looking for somebody from an intact family, and this boy's parents were divorced. His mother was unbelievable, and the family was very, very close-knit, but it didn't matter to her. She only wanted somebody from a, um, a family that, you know, from two parents that were married where there was no divorce. Okay, you know, I would have left it at that, but she went on to say, did you know that his father left the country for a couple of years so that he didn't have to pay child support? So I said to her, no, I didn't know that, and I don't think I needed to know that. And I found out after the fact that she told every one of his friends that she called for information, that same wow. same story about his father. Then she went on to say that he was in real estate, and a person who's in real estate can't possibly be smart enough for her daughter. And she went on to say that her boys were the youngest Talmidim in a certain yeshiva to ever get smicha because they were so brilliant. And they were not the smartest ones in the family. The daughter was the smartest one in the family. So, you know, I I said to her, listen, just because somebody chooses a particular career does not define how intelligent they are. He, He This particular guy was very successful at what he did. He made a lot of money. And he was a real people person, and he was a a numbers person, and, you know, he loved what he did. And then I added, you know, husband and wife don't have to, you know, intellectually be exactly on the same level. You could have one smarter than the other, and um, I gave a personal example of of a family member who um, was extremely academic, who married a family member of ours who was smart, but not as academic. And she, her response to me was, oh, I know those type, um, the ones that like to marry the dumb bunnies. Oh, sounds like a real charmer, this lady. And at that point, I said to her, you know what, Mrs. So-and-so, I don't do this to be insulted and to have my family members insulted, and I wish you lots of luck marrying off your daughter. And I neglected to mention that it was 1130 at night that she called me. Um, And I hung up on her. I got a call from my friend Chaya um, about... 15, 20 minutes later, telling me that this woman called her then to let her know that um, I hung up on her and she's Michael me. <laughs> I love people so much sometimes. Just, you know, in terms of shaduchim that you and that you and Chai have made or even shaduchim that you've made um, on your own before you were officially a shadchan. What's a, a story of, you know, maybe a story of a, of, of a shaduch that shouldn't have worked out or some inspiring story about a couple that you set up that, um, that, you know, maybe there was a bump in the road and then things took a turn for the better. Okay, so several years ago, a friend and I thought of a really good shidduch and um, the girl did not want to go out with the guy because he was farty and uh, she was actually half farty. Her father was farty, but she really only wanted to marry an Ashkenazi guy. But her mother put a lot of pressure on her, and um, she she ended up going out with the guy. And on the first date, she said to him, I just want you to know that I have no intentions of marrying a Sephardi, so this isn't going to go anywhere. And his response to her was, and I have every intention of changing your mind. What a line. <laughs> yep, and I would say it must be... Um, 20 years later, they just married off their first child. Oh, wow. Several years. Several years. That was 20 years. Okay. Very wow. good. Um, all right. Uh, I think let's, let's, uh, let's bring IJ in. IJ had some questions that he wanted to ask. Um, IJ is, of course, our head host and co-creator of the Nobody Talks Shaduchim podcast. I've been waiting my whole life to say, IJ, welcome to the Nobody Talks Shaduchim podcast. Take it away, brother. Mrs. Laster, thanks for coming on. Hi, IJ. I know we worked together many times. Yes, we definitely have. <laughs> um, my first question is for you. Let me open up with a little bit of a premise. But many years ago, Shadchanits, Shadchans, would call up a single. They'd set up a time to meet, you know, give a little bit of a light introduction. 
but overall the point of the conversation was to meet in person because, you know, the only way to get your resume over to anybody was to fax it. Maybe even, at the time, email for some of those techies back in the day. But now, there's such a quick, constant, and agile system where the whole shit of setting up system has really moved on to WhatsApp. So with modern day technology, and I feel old by saying technology, but the modern day methods with WhatsApp, things being quick, how has this impacted Shad Khanit, the, the setup? What are the overall impacts from moving the platform from meeting and answering, you know, and answering a box to like WhatsApp, instant, um, instant communication. So if I recall correctly, several years ago, you and I and Chaya Kaplowitz actually met face to face and, um, and I remember it like it, ha- it was yesterday because you left such a nice impression on us. And that's what I... Cue the applause, IJ. <laughs> and that's actually what I miss right now. Um, I miss meeting people face-to-face and, you know, getting a sense of their personality, getting a sense of the type of person that will work for them. You can tell a person's, you know, manners. You could tell their midos. You could tell whether a person is organized or disorganized. If I recall correctly, you came with a folder and you had your two copies of your resumes inside and, um, you know, you were very organized and dressed very nicely and made a really nice impression. So now on WhatsApp, um, the positive side is that, you know, we get a resume after resume after resume, um, starts at about six o'clock in the morning and it goes till one, two a.m. easy, nonstop posting. For some people, you know, who who really do this full time, it's amazing for them, um, for people like me who work and, you know, who are busy with family and other obligations, it could be very overwhelming at times. And um, I try to take a couple times during the day to look back and to see what singles are being posted on these WhatsApp groups. But gets to a point sometimes where the resumes, they all just look the same and you don't get a sense of the person. So it's really like, you know, sometimes just blindly sending suggestions that make no sense. Um, sometimes it does work. I've actually had it where I did like eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a shut up by the toe and and had a successful, very recently had a successful shit up that way. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, I'm just a shaliach and Hashem, you know, decides who and when. But um, I started again asking people to come meet me face to face. And um, I missed that a lot during COVID. When COVID started, I, I stopped having people come. But the last several months when people reach out to me, I tell them it's it's very helpful um, when I sit with a person, even if it's for two minutes, I can get such a good sense of a person in, in, in two minutes, just the way they make eye contact, the way they sit, the way they're dressed, um, the, you know, the, the way they speak, if they're outgoing, if they're quiet. Um, it's, it's very, very helpful. So that's something that I really did start to miss when, you know, all of this um, new technology started. And uh, Yona, how technologically savvy am I? Oh, very. <laughs> I'm constantly calling Yona. Yona, I need help. <laughs> I um, My phone's not working anymore. I messed it up. My WhatsApp is too full. I don't know how to delete anything. Um, so, you know, all of this is a little bit over my head. I am getting used to it and I am learning, but through the WhatsApp, I've met wonderful people and I, you know, and I do come into contact with a lot of singles on, on the WhatsApp that I reach out to. And sometimes we speak on the phone. Now, sometimes we speak on, on FaceTime, on Zoom. So, you know, it it definitely is working and it is tons of Shadduchim. Every day there are Shadduchim posted on my WhatsApp group that, 
you know, were a direct result from, I belong to three WhatsApp groups now, um, that are direct results from those WhatsApp groups. So they definitely are very, very successful. I met wonderful Shadchanim through the groups. I met wonderful singles through the groups. Um, personally, I do prefer to meet with a single, but, you know, I, I do set up a lot of um, resumes that I find on the WhatsApp groups as well. You know that someone's really technologically savvy when they refer to it as the WhatsApp. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. IJ, uh, what else you got for us? What other questions you wanted to ask? You know, one next question I, I'd like to ask is, what is something as a Shad Hanit, you know, taking responsibility, which I know you do because we've worked together before, what is something that you would do differently that you used to when you used to set up when you would set up singles perhaps a few years ago or even a week ago something that you really actually came to terms with and said you know that might not be such an important question or might not be such an important matter to gauge and push the singles on so I used to um, get very specific um, in my questioning, whether it's, um, you know, hashkafic questions. Um, do you use the internet? Do you want a TV? Do you watch, you know, videos in your home? And I used to pass on the information to the other side. And then I realized if two people are on the same page in most areas, but one has internet or a smartphone and the other one doesn't. That's something that, you know, two adults could discuss and if need be compromise on because at the end of the day, a successful marriage is all about communication and compromising. So I decided to take a step back and um, not focus on, you know, those types of questions so much and just give a more general description and then, you know, let the two of them find out all the little details on their own. And, and I find that it, it has been working because in the past I used to get a lot of no's when one had a smartphone and one didn't. And now I find people a lot more willing to compromise once they've met a person and they like the person. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is I used to push looks a lot. And when I say I used to push looks, if a guy would tell me, for example, that, you know, the girl is in his look, I would um, say, but look, she's so pretty. I would really try to give all the positives. And, um, you know, then my three boys grew up and they themselves were dating and they told me, my drop it. So I finally listened. And um, if somebody tells me, not just a guy, a girl as well, you know, it's not my look. I'm not attracted. Um, I, I drop it and I don't push it. All right. These are good. IJ, we got all night here. What do you got next? My final question, I, I, I promise. <laughs> um, as... As a mother who not only set people up in Shaduchim, but at the same time, you had several single children in the, in the, in the market, on the market, in the system. Um, what is something that you would recommend to parents that parents should do? And uh, let's say a two-part question here, and a, fo- and a follow-up on that would be, what would you recommend to singles to tell their parents when they're inquiring about Shaduch and they're inquiring about, you know, our singles in the journey? Well, I'm going to add to that, IJ. Uh, you know, like we did before, we, we had three categories. Throw in Shadchanim too. What advice would you give to, to singles, parents, and Shadchanim? Okay, so I'm going to start with the parents. Um, as a parent who in the last... Um, few years married off four children, Baruch Hashem, I can tell you honestly that I was very, very open-minded. My friends were shocked at um, some of the people I encouraged my kids to go out with. And that's what I really recommend to everybody. What's, you know, worst, worst possible scenario is your, you know, child might go out with somebody who, you know, who isn't for them. That's it. But what if that person is for them? You're losing out on on an opportunity if you're just saying no, you know, based on on 
a yeshiva that they went to or based on, you know, I'll say it again, their height. Um, I have many, many people that will look at a resume and the parents will say, oh, he went to that yeshiva. He's not for my daughter. Why don't you find out first why he went to that yeshiva? Maybe his friends went to that yeshiva. Maybe he went to that yeshiva and he grew tremendously in that yeshiva and he, you know, moved on and and he now is for your daughter. Um, so I was very open-minded and I didn't, you know, I didn't say, why should my child go out with him or her? I said, is there a really good reason why my child should not go out with him or her? And I think, Yona, you could attest to that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Baruch Hashem, you know, it worked for us. Um, I find that parents think that, and they should, every parent should think that their child is the best, but... When you think your child is the best and you have very, very high expectations, you're going to fail. You have to be realistic and, and open-minded. That's my advice to parents. And what about to, um, to the singles and to the shadchanim? So um, to the singles, again, I also say, you know, think very, very carefully why you are saying no. Don't just nix something because of, you know, a generality that you might see on a resume. Think think very, very carefully if the one inch is really going to make a difference. Think very, very carefully if those six months are really going to make a difference. Um, you know, I, I, I had a guy that wouldn't go out with a girl who was three months older than him. You know, why, you know, he said that he just couldn't deal with the fact that his wife would be older than him. Um, you know, things like that. I really think that, um, that you should think through, never compromise on, on Midos, on character, um, Hashkafos, I wouldn't ever tell anybody to compromise on. But all the things that, you know, in the scheme of things really aren't that important. Um, I, I really think you should, singles should think over very carefully before saying no. Okay, and Shad Khanim? Okay, uh, as far as the Shad Khanim go, I think Shad Khanim just need to be a little bit more sensitive and they need to... Um, they need to speak to the singles with a little bit more respect. Sometimes Shatchanim will dictate and they'll give off an air of authority and it'll be very intimidating to the singles. So I, I think the Shatchan should try to come off more as somebody who's approachable and somebody that the singles can speak with. And, you know, if a single is comfortable speaking to a shachin and there's proper communication, I think it'll just be the best thing for everybody involved. Okay. Thank you very much. And let's move on to our lightning round. And after that, we'll go for closing. Khan, you want to take the lightning round? Absolutely. Okay. So I'll read the prompts for our lightning round and then we can all answer them. Our lightning round is called set up or fed up. So would you set them up or would this make you completely fed up? Item number one, the parents come to the meeting and answer all the questions without letting him or her get a word in. I'd say fed up for that one. I would not want to work with those people. Absolutely fed up. That is unacceptable in my opinion, and I would not have any tolerance for that. Fed up. I get that all the time, and I, I can't set up somebody who can't speak for themselves. See, you're, you actually are fed up. We would be fed up, we but you already, you already are. Okay. Okay, next item. Has a sibling who's in jail for murder. I would set them up as long as they're not an accessory or anything. <laughs> yeah, I totally. I, I totally agree. I would set someone up no matter their, their family situation. Uh, ultimately, you're dealing with the person themselves. And, uh, you know, they could have the, com- the most messed up family situation. But if they're a wonderful person, why not? I have no problem setting up a single that has any type of family situation. I look at the individual, not the family. And what if they need someone who only wears designer clothing? 
I, I don't disagree. I, I don't agree with the premise. I think that that is a pretty shallow thing, but I feel like on the other hand, it's not impossible to find. So I would probably take a whack at setting such a person up. Yeah. So I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I would probably tell them, frankly, I would probably say, listen, you're making things unnecessarily difficult for yourself. And, you know, let, let's uh, see if they want to work with me, but if they still want to continue working with me, um, and, uh, you know, and I happen to think of someone that also is kind of stuck up in that way, then sure, what the heck. If I had somebody that only wore designer clothing, I would definitely set them up with that person. But I wouldn't try to push, you know, somebody that was not um, as well dressed as they'd like on them. Fair enough. What if they need someone who will accept them along with their pet? So... I have I have mixed feelings on this. On the one hand, um, that everyone is perfectly within their right to um, to own their pet and not have to give it up if that's not something they want to do. Um, like Yona, like like what you said before with uh, the person who requires a designer label partner, I would definitely make sure that they're aware of the way in which they're limiting themselves. But at the same time, you know, people come with all sorts of requirements. So if this is their requirement, then I would, I would try to set them up with someone who's okay with it. As someone who is a lifelong pet owner and has owned every single pet you can imagine and many others that you can't imagine, um, and came into marriage with a pet, I would tell the single that they are limiting themselves and I would bring my own personal life into it and explain that even I, as an avid pet owner, um, who at the time that I was dating had a lovely cat named Misha, who we still have to this day because Khani was gracious enough to give it a shot. I was open-minded. Yes, she was open-minded. Very good. That's that's a lesson out there for the singles. But um, but yeah, I, I, I would definitely, I would be willing to set them up for sure because I can completely relate and understand how difficult it is to give up a pet. A pet, I think, is something, it's a little bit less frivolous than designer clothing, in my opinion, because it's something that you really develop a bond with. But I would still say that ultimately there are priorities. And, um, you know, I myself was was very sad, but fully expected that it would, you know, that it, that I would have to get rid of my cat. And it would have made me really sad, but ultimately... Um, you got to make some sacrifices and that's a sacrifice that you definitely should be willing to make before you go into dating. So I would definitely set up somebody who had um, those pet expectations, but I would give them my very strong opinion and um, encourage them like our good friend encouraged Yona to take the fact that he had all those pets off of his resume. (laughs) At the Shabbos table, our host said that he's responsible for Yona getting married because Yona got married very shortly after the blurb about his pets was taken off of his resume. I have to say, it's probably a good thing that I didn't see that. Because after Noted. That, your resume was so normal. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. What if they don't say thank you after meeting you? I, I would, I'm leaning towards the fed up side. I I feel like on the one hand, if I would meet the opposite gender who does the same thing, I would be inclined to maybe set the two up. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't be setting, I feel like I wouldn't be setting them up for success. So it's, it's unlikely that I would. Um, Yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess it would depend on the situation. If the person was a, let's say a very nervous person and I got the vibe that the reason why they were not saying thank you was just because they were so flustered and nervous. Um, I would maybe be a little bit more generous towards them and give them the benefit of the doubt. But in general, that is a very bad sign. That is an absolute red flag. And uh, in general, I would be fed up. Well, I might be fed up. I'm fed up with so many people that I'm sure that I could find somebody else that I'm fed up with and stick those two together. That is fair. Sounds like a plan. Okay, and the final prompt, what if they work the night shift at a gas station? I first want to know, when do they date, if that's what they do at at night? Um, But, I mean, if it's just a thing that they do to bring in some extra cash, I don't have a problem with it on principle. I would set them up once I got a solid explanation for why, because it's definitely not a typical way for people to spend their nights. So, um... 
is this person working exclusively at the gas station or do they have another job? I mean, either way, the truth is, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I would be curious to know more, but, uh, I, I don't think that a person should be judged by the job that they have. And I think that there are some people out there who maybe will be intrigued by someone who works the night shift at a gas station and wouldn't mind. So, I mean, you know, hopefully they have higher aspirations in life, but uh, that's not for me to uh, to really judge. So I'd set them up. Well, I'd have to know a little bit more about the person other than the fact that they work at the gas station at night. Um, but, you know, there's they say there's a lid for every pot. So... Try to find the lid that works with the gas station attendant. Maybe the 24-7 drive through barista at Starbucks. Ah, so there we go. We got something here. one spouse at home missing the other because they both do the night shift. For all our uh, gas station attendants out there, we'll, uh, we'll try to find you a Starbucks barista. <laughs> okay, and let's move on to our closing statements. I feel like we highlighted a lot tonight, the good, the bad, the ugly, the areas for improvement. And um, I feel like everybody, whether they're on the dating scene for two months of their life or 12 years of their life and everything in between, um, has the opportunity to kind of create their own experience. We know that a lot of it is not in our personal control, but if every person becomes both the advocate for themselves and the voice of what's right, what's the right thing to do, um, it might make it a little more tolerable for everyone. And that goes for parents, people who are dating, and Shad Khanim. If everyone goes in with the focus of, I want to do the right thing for for other people, if you're the one dating, then obviously for yourself as well. But since we're not, we're unfortunately not going to overhaul an entire system and its flaws overnight. I feel like it's a matter of every person putting forth their own effort to make their experience and the people who, um, who they come in contact with, um, come away with the best that they possibly can. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of generalities out there. You know, there's a lot of black and white, the shidduch system is good. The shidduch system is bad. Shalchanim are good. Shalchanim are bad. People who go to this yeshiva are good. People who go to this yeshiva are, are, are you know, are bad. Like there's there's so much uh, generalization out there, and I think that um, this ultimately ties in very much to the idea of not being rigid and of being flexible, um, which was discussed so much during this episode. Um, you know, I think that that part of part of being rigid is having these these black and white dichotomies and not allowing for there to be gray area in between. So I think it's important for everybody to just take a step back and realize that there are good things about the shidduch system and there are bad things and there are things that are just neutral and there are things that work for some people but not others. And, you know, you can you can talk about the issues with the system without trying to throw out the entire system and reinvent the wheel. You can talk about how there are some shadchanim out there who really handle things in a horrible and dishonest and uh, manipulative way, while still recognizing that probably the vast majority of them are are good people, and some of them are well-meaning but make mistakes. Um, and just in general, having having that that gray area, the ability to think of things not in terms of black and white, um, will allow you to broaden your horizons and open yourself up to experiences that maybe you otherwise would not have allowed yourself to engage in. So every experience in life um, has its positives and its negatives, and a lot of it has to do with what you make of it. So if you go into this whole shidduch parsha with a positive attitude and you make connections and you keep those connections positive and you keep your attitude positive as hard as it is, it'll work and it might take longer, but if you keep that positive attitude and you form positive relationships with Shad Khanim and with other singles to support you, then you know, it'll be a good experience. But, you know, once a person starts to become bitter, everything is bad. The shatchan is bad. The people they're dating is bad. The date is bad. Everything is bad. And, um, you know, what what everybody should know is most shatchanim are in this to do some good. And even those that 
might not be so sensitive and might say the wrong thing sometimes. It's not coming from a bad place. It's, you know, sometimes it's just that they're not thinking or they just don't know the right way to speak. And um, best thing to do is to try to just take a deep breath and say, you know, she didn't just say that. I didn't just hear that. And then, you know, talk to somebody else. But just keeping the attitude positive, keeping in contact with Shad Hanem. Um, I always ask people to um, WhatsApp me once a month, just, hi, how are you doing? Reminding you that I'm here. Um, I deal with so many people, it's impossible to remember everybody all the time. So those that reach out to me, I, I try for. And understand also that if a Shad Khan doesn't get back to you, they're not ignoring you. Just life happens, and it is so hard to get back, you know, in touch with everybody that reaches out. I mean, I, I just had somebody reach out to me last week that they needed a meal for Shabbos, and it was Yona who who told me, you know, so-and-so needs a meal and you're not getting back to him because I was dealing with so many shidduch issues and work issues and personal issues. So, you know, both sides need to understand, you know, the, the shadcha needs to understand that the single needs, you know, TLC and compassion and and the single should just understand that the shadchan, you know, sometimes um, is busy and life happens, but, you know, does not ever chas v'shalom mean to personally, you know, offend or upset anybody. And if, you know, everybody could just respect one another and keep the attitudes positive, hopefully we can get through this in a positive way. Thanks so much for joining us, Ma, Mommy, Queen Shadchan. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you after hearing this podcast, how would you like for them to do that? Thank you so much for having me. It has really been a lot of fun tonight. Um, best way to reach me is by email, Queens Shadchan. There's two S's there, Queens Shadchan at gmail.com. It might take me a day or two to get back to you, but I will always respond if you reach out to me via email. And the best thing is if you reach out to Queens Shadchan at gmail.com, you'll be getting the attention of not one, but two Shadchanim because uh, we have Chaya Kaplowitz as well. So uh, it's a two for one can't lose. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to everyone for tuning in. And as I always like to end just to be contrary to IJ sad face, frowny face serious face. This is the Nobody Talks Shadokhan Podcast. Nobody talks Nobody talks Nobody talks Shadokhan This is the Nobody Talks Shadokhan Podcast. Alchi's Media Network.